Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Trisha Chivas, TMA's Director of Development and Strategic Partnerships. I will be moderating this session, and I want to thank you for joining this webinar. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started today. Phones will be muted throughout the presentation. However, we encourage you to ask questions. There is a chat box located at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions into the box at any time throughout the presentation. We will have a question and answer period at the end for Dr. Menard and Ms. Bateman to respond. This webinar will be recorded and will live on our website for future reference. I would now like to introduce Mary McGowan, Executive Director of the Myositis Association. Thank you, Tricia, and good afternoon. Welcome to the Myositis Association's webinar, FDA's Role in Drug Development. I am Mary McGowan, Executive Director of the Myositis Association. For those of you who are not familiar with the Myositis Association, we are the leading international nonprofit organization committed to the global community of people living with myositis, their care partners, family members, and clinicians. TMA provides patient education and support, advocacy, physician education, and research funding for myositis diseases. For more information, please visit myositis.org. Next slide, please. It is my honor to introduce our guest speakers for today's webinar from the FDA. Dr. Janet Maynard, as the Director of the Office of Orphan Products Development, oversees legislatively mandated designation and grant programs intended to promote the development of products for rare diseases, including orphan drug, rare pediatric disease, and humanitarian use device designation programs, as well as clinical trial, natural history study, and pediatric device consortia grant programs. In her role, she serves as FDA's lead in coordinating cross-cutting rare disease issues and engages extensively with patients, sponsors, and other stakeholders. Prior to OOPD, Dr. Maynard worked in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where she was a clinical team leader in the Division of Anesthesia, Analgesia, and Addiction, Pro Addiction Products. Dr. Maynard has been with FDA since 2011, when she joined FDA's Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Rheumatology Products as a medical officer before becoming a clinical team leader in that division. At FDA, she has worked with an interdisciplinary team of scientists in evaluating the safety and efficacy of drugs and provided regulatory and scientific guidance to drug developers. She has supported drug development through collaboration with stakeholders in various national and international forums. In addition, she has worked on complex development considerations related to rare diseases such as rare and serious auto-inflammatory diseases. Dr. Maynard received her medical degree from Vanderbilt University and completed a residency in internal medicine at Duke Hospital. Subsequently, she completed a fellowship in rheumatology at Johns Hopkins Hospital. During her fellowship, she completed a Master's of Health Science at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Graduate Training Program in Clinical Investigation. I am also pleased to introduce Ms. Lauren Bateman. Lauren Bateman is a project manager in the Office of Clinical Policy and Programs in the Office of the Commissioner. She works with the FDA Medical Product Centers and other offices to coordinate the agency's ongoing cross-center initiatives and fosters collaboration within FDA with other agencies, external stakeholders, and international bodies. Ms. Bateman primarily supports the patient affairs staff's cross-cutting patient engagement activities to ensure patient, caregiver, and advocate perspectives are incorporated into FDA's regulatory discussions. This includes the implementation and execution of patient listening sessions, which help FDA understand what is important to patient communities when medical products are being developed. Prior to this role, Ms. Bateman worked as a contractor at the FDA, supporting other cross-cutting projects, including piloting and implementing the Intercenter Consult Request Program for the review of combination products. She also coordinated numerous public FDA meetings, including ones focused on rare diseases and conditions. Before working with FDA, Ms. Bateman worked directly with patients in clinical settings at physical therapy and oral surgery centers. 
Ms. Bateman has an MS in Biodefense from George Mason University and a BS in Biological Sciences from University of Maryland College Park. Additionally, she is a certified associate in project management. Dr. Raynard and Ms. Bateman, thank you so much for being with us on today's webinar, and I will now turn the webinar over to you. Great, thank you so much. So my name is Janet Maynard, and I'm the director of the Office of Working Products. If we could please go to the next slide. So it is a pleasure to be here today to speak about FDA's role in drug development and rare diseases. In terms of my background, I am a rheumatologist and have cared for patients with both common and rare diseases, including myositis. I was drawn to working on rare diseases at FDA because I have seen patients and families struggling with rare diseases such as myositis. I understand the importance of therapeutic options for patients and recognize many of the challenges faced in developing products for rare diseases. Prior to joining the Office of Orphan Products Development in October 2018, I worked in FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research for over seven years. CEDAR works with pharmaceutical companies to support the development of drugs and biologics for a variety of diseases, including myositis. At FDA, we are committed to helping see the development and availability of new therapies for rare diseases. Next slide, please. This is a standard disclaimer and disclosure slide. This presentation is not intended to convey official U.S. FDA policy, and no official support or endorsement by the U.S. FDA is provided or should be inferred. The materials presented here are all in the public domain. Next slide, please. This morning, I will present on FDA's role in drug development and rare diseases, and then Lauren Bateman will present on FDA's patient affairs staff. In this part of the talk, we will cover three main areas. First, I will provide an overview of FDA and historical considerations. Second, I will discuss drug development. And third, I will highlight key programs in the Office of Orphan Products Development. Next slide. First, we will start with an overview of FDA and historical considerations. Next slide, please. The Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, is the oldest comprehensive consumer protection agency in the U.S. federal government. It is a scientific, regulatory, and public health agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, that works to protect and promote public health. Great, this slide is perfect. Oh, the next slide, please. Thank you. The U.S. FDA is a science-based regulatory agency that is organized by product area. The agency grew from a single chemist in the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1862 to a staff of over 14,000 employees and a fiscal year 2018 budget of $5.4 million in total resources. FDA staff is comprised of chemists, physicians, pharmacologists, toxicologists, microbiologists, veterinarians, pharmacists, lawyers, and many others. About a third of the agency's employees are stationed outside of Washington, D.C., staffing over 150 field offices and laboratories, including five regional offices and 20 district offices. Notably, FDA-regulated products account for about 20 cents of every dollar spent by U.S. consumers. Next slide, please. The scope of FDA's regulatory authority is very broad. FDA's responsibilities are closely related to those of several other government agencies. In general, FDA regulates foods, including infant formulas and dietary supplements, drugs, including prescription drugs, both brand name and generic, and non-prescription or over-the-counter drugs, biologics, including vaccines and blood products, medical devices, from simple items like tongue depressors to complex technologies such as heart pacemakers. Electronic products that give off radiation, such as laser products, cosmetics, including color additives found in makeup and nail polish, veterinary products, including pet foods and veterinary drugs and devices, and tobacco products, including cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. Next slide, please. 
FDA is responsible for protecting the public health by assuring that foods, except for meat from livestock, poultry, and some egg products, are safe, wholesome, sanitary, and properly labeled, and ensuring that human and veterinary drugs and vaccines and other biological products and medical devices intended for human use are safe and effective. Second, protecting the public from electronic product, product radiation. Third, assuring cosmetics and dietary supplements are safe and properly labeled. Fourth, regulating tobacco products. And fifth, advancing public health by helping to speed product innovation. Next slide, please. To better understand FDA's public health mission, it is helpful to review U.S. food and drug history. The conditions of the U.S. food and drug industries a century ago could hardly be imagined today. In the 1980s, there was minimal oversight of food and drugs. Medicines with opium, morphine, heroin, and cocaine were sold without restrictions. You may know the term snake oil, which was sold and is an expression that originally referred to fraudulent health products or unproven medicine. It has come to refer to any product with questionable or unverifiable quality or benefit. These products were used widely by consumers, but no one knew what was in them. They didn't know, they didn't have to contain anything at all. Next slide, please. The modern era of FDA dates to 1906 with the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act. This added regulatory functions to the agency's scientific mission. This act prohibit prohibited interstate transport of unlawful food and drugs under penalty of seizure of the questionable products and prosecution of the responsible parties. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 was intended to address misbranding of those products. Of note, it did not address the pre-market review of drugs. This act tried to assure that whatever was said to be a food or a medication actually was in the food or medication and met some standard of strength and purity. Influential works at this time included those by Samuel Hopkins Adams entitled The Great American Fraud and Upton Sinclair's novel The Jungle, which exposed egregious offenses in the food industry. Next slide, please. Important as it was, the 1906 Act was rife with shortcomings, such as its failure to regulate medical devices or cosmetics, the lack of explicit authority to conduct factory inspections, and the inability to control what drugs could be marketed. The truth of the shortcomings became evident when a company introduced a wick for sulfonilamide in September 1937. This attempt to introduce a flavorful oral dosage form of the new anti-infective Wonder Drug was a disaster. The firm used an untested solvent, diethylene glycol, which is chemically related to antifreeze. By the time FDA became aware of the problem and it removed the product from pharmacy shelves and medicine cabinets around the country, the preparation had caused 107 deaths, including many children. The firm whose president maintained that the deaths were due to an idiosyncratic reaction to the false drug could be prosecuted only for distributing a misbranded drug and elixir because it had to contain alcohol as a solvent. Next slide, please. The elixir sulfonilamide disaster reinvigorated a bill to replace the 1906 act that had been languishing in Congress since 1933. Further refined, President Roosevelt signed the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act into law in 1938. Among many other provisions, the 1938 Act required that firms had to prove to the FDA that any new drug was safe before it could be marketed, leading to the birth of the new drug application. The new law covered cosmetics and medical devices, authorized factory inspections, and outlawed bogus, excuse me, bogus therapeutic claims for drugs. Those drugs had to bear adequate directions for safe use, which included warnings whenever necessary. It brought about the concept of prescription medication with consideration of which drugs actually required a prescription for use. Next slide, please. However, there were also shortcomings with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. As with the 1938 Excuse me, as with the 1938 Act, a therapeutic disaster compelled passage of the new law. In this case, the disaster was narrowly averted. Polidamide sedative was nearly approved, was, excuse me, was never approved in this country, 
but it caused thousands of grossly uh, deformed newborns outside of the United States. The new law mandated efficacy as well as safety before a drug could be marketed, instituted stricter agency control over drug trials, transferred from the Federal Trade Commission to the FDA regulation of prescription drug advertising, and established good manufacturing practices by the drug industry. This photograph shows Dr. Francis Kelsey, who received the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service. Next slide, please. Thus, it is clear that in the relatively recent past, there have been significant changes in drug development and growth of pharmaceutical science. Clinical trials are performed to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of medications. There are ongoing developments in drug discovery, manufacturing abilities, and precision medicine. Society has to come to expect that medicines will be developed. Some diseases that were previously fatal are now chronic diseases. The importance of many medications to society is clear, and the development of safe and effective drugs is essential to public health. Next slide, please. We will now move from an overview of FDA and historical considerations to FDA's support of drug development. Next slide, please. FDA is composed of various centers and offices, including medical product centers that approve biologic drugs and devices. First, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER, ensures the safety, purity, potency, and effectiveness of biological products including vaccines, blood and blood products, and cells, tissues, and gene therapy for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of human diseases, conditions, or injury. Second, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH, protects and promotes public health by assuring that patients and providers have timely and continued access to safe, effective, and high-quality medical devices and safe radiation-emitting products. Third, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, performs an essential public health task by making sure that safe and effective drugs are available to improve the health of people in the United States. As part of the FDA, CEDAR regulates over-the-counter and prescription drugs, including biological, therapeutics, and generic drugs. This work covers more than just medicines. For example, fluoride toothpaste, Annie's person, dandruff shampoos, and sunscreens are all considered drugs. Next slide. In addition to the medical product centers, FDA has offices that support product development in a variety of ways. The Office of Work and Products Development is within the Office of Clinical Policy and Programs. The Office of Clinical Policy and Programs reports to the Principal Deputy Commissioner. The goal of the Office of Clinical Policy and Programs is to advance public health by developing and leading cross-cutting policy and programs in collaboration with internal and external stakeholders to support FDA centers in making effective, safe, and innovative medical products available to the American people. Next slide, please. FDA works with pharmaceutical companies and investigators who study medical products. Researchers design clinical trials to answer specific research questions related to a medical product. In drug development, there are four phases. Phase one studies are the first to evaluate the drug in humans. The main purpose of phase one studies is to evaluate the safety of the drug. Phase two studies evaluate a range of dosages and evaluate the efficacy of the drug. Phase three studies are generally larger and are the pivotal studies that help evaluate the efficacy and safety of the drug in a group of patients with the disease. Phase four studies are completed after the drug is approved and collect additional post-marketing information about a drug. Next slide, please. Drug development can be broadly characterized or categorized into two periods, the investigational period and the approval period. During the investigational phase, an investigational new drug or IND application is a request for authorization from FDA to administer an investigational drug or biological product to humans. Such authorization must be secured prior to interstate shipment and administration of any new drug 
that is not subject that is not the subject of a new drug application or biological license application. During the investigational phase, data is obtained to see if the drug is safe and effective for its intended use. Next slide, please. After the investigational phase, the data are reviewed and a sponsor, such as a pharmaceutical company, decides whether to request approval of the drug for a specific indication. Before the drug is marketed, it must be reviewed and approved by FDA through a new drug application on NDA or a biologic license application or BLA. The documentation required in an NDA or BLA is supposed to tell the drug's whole story, including what happened during the clinical test, what the ingredients of the drug are, the results of the animal studies, how the drug behaves in the body, and how it is manufactured, processed, and packaged. FDA will approve an application after it determines that the drug meets the statutory standards for safety and effectiveness, manufacturing and control, and labeling. Next slide, please. For product approval, the data must support that the benefits of the product outweigh its risk. A benefit is the positive impact of the drug on how a patient feels, functions, or survives. Ensuring the safety, effectiveness, and quality of human drugs is an increasingly complicated regulatory task, requiring FDA's experts to consider a multitude of complex factors. Over the past several years, FDA has developed an enhanced structured approach to the benefit risk assessment and regulatory decision making for human drug and biological products. FDA assesses the benefits and the risk of the products and considers these benefits and risks in the context of the disease that was studied. Patients provide critical input that helps FDA understand these benefits and risks. In her talk, Lauren Bateman will review some ways that patients can be involved in FDA's regulatory processes. Next slide, please. We will now move from drug development considerations to an overview of the Office of Orphan Products Development. Next slide, please. The Office of Orphan Products Development, or OOPD, was established in 1982 to promote the development of products for rare diseases. OOPD is now tasked with administering some of the provisions of the Orphan Drug Act and other statutory provisions for rare diseases and pediatric device product development. OOPD is within the Office of Clinical Policy and Programs in the Office of the Commissioner. OOPD's vision is the availability of safe and effective products for patients who live with rare diseases. OOP's mission is to advance the evaluation and development of promising products, including drugs, biologics, devices, and medical foods for rare diseases through OOPD product designation and grant programs and for strategic orphan product collaborations and initiatives. Next slide, please. The Office of Orphan Product Development has two core program areas, our designation programs and our grant programs. The designation program includes three components, orphan drug designation and exclusivity, rare pediatric disease designation, and humanitarian use device designation. The grants program includes three components too, orphan product clinical trial grants, pediatric device consortia, and the natural history grant program. In terms of the orphan drug designation program, Rare disease is a disease that affects less than 200,000 persons in the United States or greater than 200,000 persons with no reasonable um, expectation of recovering costs. In terms of the rare pediatric disease designation program, it's a disease that must be rare and its serious or life-threatening manifestations must primarily affect individuals 18 years and younger. The Office of Orphan Product Development works collaboratively with the Office of Pediatric Therapeutics and the product centers as part of the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review Voucher Program. Third, the Humanitarian Use Device Designation is part of the um, HUD HCE pathway and is for diseases or conditions that affect not more than 8,000 individuals in the United States per year. In terms of the grant programs, the Clinical Trial Grant 
uh, program funds clinical trials and rare diseases. The Pediatric Device Consortia funds consortia to support pediatric device development. And the Natural History Grant Program supports natural history studies. Next slide, please. We'll now review each of these programs. Our orphan product, or excuse me, our orphan drug designation program is our largest. We receive over 500 new requests for orphan drug designation each year. These requests are for drugs and biologics intended for rare diseases. We grant orphan drug designation for those requests that meet our eligibility criteria, specifically that the drug is intended for diseases or conditions that are rare, that is with a prevalence of less than 200,000 persons, and that they have provided adequate rationale for the drug effectiveness in that disease. The benefits of being, orphan of being an orphan designated drug include qualification for tax credits for clinical research, a waiver of, mark of the marketing application fees, and potential orphan exclusivity. Next slide, please. Another designation program in my office is the Rare Pediatric Disease Program, which is intended to stimulate the development of products for rare diseases in pediatric patients. In this program, our staff works with the Office of Pediatric Therapeutics, or OPT, to determine if a request meets the criteria. OOPD staff confirm the prevalence, that is, is the disease rare, and OPT staff confirm if it is serious or life-threatening uh, the serious or life threatening manifestations primarily affect children. Products that receive rare pediatric disease designation may qualify for a rare pediatric disease priority review voucher. These vouchers are quite valuable to companies as they are redeemed to get a priority review of a future marketing application for a different product. Some of these vouchers have been sold for large sums of money. Next slide, please. The third designation program is for devices. It is a humanitarian use device designation program. To qualify for this designation, a device must be intended for use in the treatment, prevention, or diagnosis of a disease or condition with an incidence of not more than 8,000 per year. Receiving humanitarian use device designation is necessary for a device to qualify for the humanitarian device exemption or HCE review pathway in CDRH. This pathway requires a demonstration of reasonable assurance of safety and probable benefit as opposed to effectiveness, which is required for pre-market approval of a PMA. Next slide, please. Now moving to our grants program, we will first review the clinical trial grant program. The goal of the clinical trial grant program is to support efficient and innovative clinical trials for products that address unmet needs in rare diseases or conditions or provide highly significant improvements in the treatment or diagnosis of a disease. Our clinical trial grant program receives about $15.5 million per year, which allows us to provide support for phase one, two, and phase three studies. OOPD funds approximately 85 studies per year, including new grants and continuation of ongoing grants. Next slide, please. OOPD also supports a device-specific grant program. It is called the Pediatric Device Consortia. The goal of the Pediatric Device Consortia is to stimulate the development of devices for pediatric patients through the funding of networks, not directly funding grants. The budget is $6 million, and we are currently funding five new PDCs. Our recent awards include real-world evidence projects with the goal of advancing pediatric device development. Next slide, please. The last grant program we will review is our Natural History Grant Program. This program began in 2016 with the first request for applications, and funding began in fiscal year 2017. A natural history study describes the course of a disease over time, identifying demographic, genetic, environmental, and other variables that correlate with its development and outcome. Natural history studies can be prospective or retrospective. Natural history studies provide critical information for product development in rare diseases, such as information regarding key symptoms, 
that can, um, can help with endpoint design and selection in clinical studies. Next slide, please. In addition to our designation and grant programs, the Office of Orphan Products Development has important collaborations with groups both within the agency and groups outside the agency. We greatly appreciate this opportunity today to speak at this webinar and look forward to additional partnerships in the rare disease community. Next slide, please. Developing products for rare diseases such as myositis can be challenging. Optimal drug development for rare diseases requires stakeholders, including patients, patient advocacy groups, pharmaceutical companies, and the FDA to work together. This photograph shows a piece of art at FDA that highlights the importance of synergy and working together. When viewed from a distance, the piece reads as an exuberant abstraction. If you can push advance, please. Or next slide, please. Um, but if you look up close at this artwork, you see that it's made up of figures, including tiny figures dressed in FDA's lab coats. Ultimately, this artwork speaks to the integral role of partners within drug development and FDA's role within that process. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, developing a treatment for a rare disease can present unique challenges. The Office of Orphan Products Development advances the evaluation and development of promising products for rare diseases through a variety of programs, including our product designation, orphan grant program, and our collaboration. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Sorry, no, sorry. Thank Thank you. And now we'll have um, Ms. Lauren Bateman speak. Thank you, Dr. Janet Maynard, for a great presentation. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Bateman, and I'm a project manager at FDA in the Office of Clinical Policy and Programs. I am honored to be a part of the FDA's patient affairs staff team, and much of the work I do on a daily basis is centered around enhancing patient engagement at the agency. Next slide, please. During my time with you today, I plan to start with an overview of patient engagement at FDA. I will then talk about the objectives of the patient affairs staff. And finally, I will discuss some of the specific patient engagement programs both in the patient affairs staff and in the agency. Um, next slide, please. This slide demonstrates the ongoing patient engagement activities over the past 30 years, which have been increasing over time. It's hard to pinpoint when patient engagement at FDA really started, but there was an increase of engagement at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis in the late 1980s. Ever since, it has been increasing and evolving. I think we can all agree that the patient voice is important. Patients and caregivers provide insight on issues, concerns, needs, and priorities that are important to patients and family members. They have a vested interest and in diverse opinions and experiences, and these varied perspectives provide insight on risk tolerance and potential benefits. Of course, they add the human element to the work that we do every day. Ultimately, patients are at the focus of all of FDA's activities. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Next, I'm going to talk about the patient affairs staff, but first I want to quickly give you a little background. Historically, there was an office established in the late 80s to interact with patients and advocates, specifically with the HIV AIDS community. That office expanded to include oncology, then eventually all serious and life-threatening diseases and conditions. In more recent years, center-specific patient engagement components have been established as each center may have issues unique to the products they regulate. The products being drugs, biologics, and devices, as Dr. Maynard mentioned earlier. 
More recently, patient affair staff was established in late 2017, but why? HRAN's FDA study on patient engagement activities determined a need for a more coordinated effort at the commissioner level with a focus on cross-cutting issues and to be a central entry point for patient communities. Patient affairs staff is in the Office of the Com Office of Clinical Policy and Programs, which is located in the Office of the Commissioner, and reports into the Principal Deputy Commissioner. It works closely with the Medical Product Centers and other offices, and, and in collaboration with patient communities to enhance patient engagement efforts. I'm now going to talk about some of the specific patient engagement programs in the patient affairs staff. Next slide, please. I'm going to start by discussing the EMA FDA patient engagement cluster. The European Medicines Agency, or EMA, and FDA established a number of clusters over the years. Because patient engagement is a priority for both agencies and following a mutual fellowship exchange between FDA and EMA, the patient engagement cluster was established. The purpose of the cluster is to share best practices, approaches, and ideas to further enhance engagement activities. We share information on high profile topics of mutual interest, especially those that may be of great interest to the public. And we share information on how we are engaging patients, caregivers, and advocacy organizations in priorities and goals for collaboration to enhance engagement. Next slide, please. Next, I'm going to discuss the Patient Engagement Collaborative, or as we call it, the PEC for short. This program is a collaboration between the FDA and the Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative through our public-private partnership. It is an external group of patient organizations and individual representatives to discuss topics about enhancing patient engagement in medical product development and regulatory discussions at FDA. So why was the PEC established? First, FDA listened. Public docket comments from patients and other stakeholders recommended that FDA create an outside group to provide input on patient engagement across the FDA. Second, it was facilitated by legislation in both the 21st Century Cures Act and FDARA for fostering patient participation and incorporating patient experiences into the regulatory process. And third, we had a model to work from. This, the PEC, was modeled after the EMA's Patients and Consumers Working Party, or PCWP. Next slide, please. Next, I want to talk about the Rare Disease Listening Session Pilot. This program was stood up in collaboration with the National Organization for Rare Disorders, or NORD, through a Memorandum of Understanding, to provide another way to encourage communication between the patient community and FDA staff. Listening sessions are one of many ways that patients, caregivers, and their advocates can share their experience with a disease or condition by talking directly with FDA staff. Listening sessions help educate review staff about rare diseases. For example, disease and treatment burden, risk tolerance, impact on daily activities, and quality of life. They help patients and their advocates understand FDA's mission and work, and they provide a starting point to inform early stage research and development. In the last year, we have been assessing the value to consider expanding to other therapeutic areas. There are two types of listening sessions that might occur. First, our FDA requested in which FDA has a specific set of questions to ask of a particular patient subpopulation. Second, our patient requested, which occur when the patient community wants to share their experiences and perspectives with the FDA. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to talk about how patient affairs staff is working to enhance FDA communication, patient outreach, and patient education through a number of different efforts in our office. One tool that we recently stood up is the request to connect web form. 
We heard from our patient stakeholders that they were confused about where to begin when they want to engage with FDA. And former FDA commissioner, Dr. Gottlieb, wanted us to create a central point of entry for patients and patient stakeholders for patient-related inquiries and meeting requests. So, in working closely with the medical product centers and other offices, we launched Request to Connect in early March. Request to Connect is an online patient portal that routes inquiries to the appropriate medical product center or office to ensure that they are received and responded to in an, effect, in an effective and efficient manner. The portal provides an opportunity for the patient community to ask a question or request a meeting with the FDA to share their disease experience or better understand FDA's regulatory work. Currently, it is in pilot phase and we are working to refine the form. You can access the form by visiting our website www.fda.gov slash request to connect. Another effort our office is working on is improving the FDA's for patients webpage. We are doing so based on a web assessment, which included interviews with the patient community representatives. The patient engagement, patient engagement collaborative or PET that I mentioned earlier is helping with this effort. We are also managing a database of patient advocacy organizations, which currently has approximately 2,000 organizations in it. We send targeted emails on relevant FDA-related communications to patient stakeholders from this database. We are also expanding our use of social media through Twitter. I encourage you to connect with us at FDA Patient Info. And finally, we are developing an educational video series called Patients Matter, which can be found on the FDA website. Next slide, please. And one more, please. Thank you. So finally, I want to share some of the other patient engagement activities in the agency. For example, the FDA Patient Representative Program. This program began in the 1990s and offers patients and caregivers the opportunity to provide critical advice to the agency as it regulates medical products. The patient community voice is represented in regulatory discussions that can directly impact potential approvals. The FDA patient representatives are appointed as special government employees and they serve in review division consultation meetings and on advisory committees. In these activities, they have access to confidential background information. Currently, there are over 200 patients and caregivers representing over 300 diseases and conditions. Next slide, please. Thank you. In the interest of time, I just want to share this slide to demonstrate that there are many other patient engagement initiatives and programs specific to each medical product center you can see that each center has a number of different programs, which you can learn more about on our website. Next slide, please. And these are the contacts for the PATE programs and initiatives. If you would like to learn more about the patient engagement activities in each center, you are welcome to contact them through these email addresses. Alternatively, you can email us at patient affairs and we can ensure that your question is answered. Next slide, please. That brings me to the conclusion of my presentation. I want to thank you for inviting me and for your time. Patient Affairs is here to assist. So when in doubt, please contact us. You can find our contact information on this slide. And I want to thank you again for your time. Thank you very much, um, both Dr. Maynard and Ms. Bateman for these wonderful presentations. Um, next slide, please. We'll now move to our question and answer period. And as a reminder to everyone, you can um, ask a question by typing your question into the chat box that you find at the bottom of the page. Um, I see a couple people have raised their hands. We will not be unmuting, so please do, if you have any questions, type your question into the chat box so that we can include you in the queue for questions. Um, so the first question that we did get um, is, uh, what is the difference between the NIH and the FDA? And as a follow-on to that, how does the FDA work with the NIH and other researchers um, with their large budget? 
Hi, so this is uh, Janet Maynard. Um, so there, there are similarities and differences between FDA and NIH. So both FDA and NIH, we're, we're both dedicated to promoting public health and we're both within HHS. In terms of differences, so FDA's primary goal and responsibility focuses on the safe and effective development of products for Americans. And FDA regulates and approves medical products, including drugs, biologics, and devices. In addition, FDA oversees clinical studies that are evaluating medical products. And then we review the data from these studies to see if they support approval of those products. So FDA, we, we do fund clinical research here, but the scope of this is more limited than at NIH. Um, but we recognize that stakeholder collaboration is very important in rare disease product development, and that's especially true for FDA and NIH. And we work extensively with our NIH colleagues. Um, for example, within um, orphan products development, we speak monthly with our colleagues at NIH, and we work together on things related to the clinical studies, planning workshops, participating in each other's workshops. So we know that it's very important that we support each other and work together because we do have slightly different focuses to support public health. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is that um, many of the medications that people with myositis use, if there are any available, are off-label use, and this creates challenges for patients when there are medication shortages, as there currently is with um, IVIG, which is one of the medications that, that people with myositis use, um, and this also presents challenges for um, insurance approval. Um, what is the FDA's recommendation to address this issue? Yeah, that, that is a complicated um, and very good question. So I guess maybe there's two main points that I wanted to bring up. Um, the first is that we recognize in, in rare diseases such as myositis that lack of approved therapies that can really pose a significant issue for patients. Um, and as you noted in the question, um, issues can raise related to insurance coverage, and it can be just very challenging um, in that situation. When I think about sort of what are the recommendations trying to help develop products for a rare disease, I, I think it's important to think about the key issues and knowing that key issue sort of help bring the right stakeholders together. So it's important to think about is, is there not an approved therapy because there isn't anything that's been shown to be effective or is it because there aren't uh, clinical trials that have established efficacy? Is it an issue where a pharmaceutical company hasn't been interested in bringing the product to market or uh, sort of analyzing the situation and what's going on and better understanding what the key issue is will help, I think, address some of the potential questions. Uh, and what I found is once there's sort of a better understanding of what the main limitation is or what kind of needs to be overcome, that can help bring together the right stakeholders so that um, drugs can be approved for a variety of rare diseases. But it does generally take groups working together. And I've seen um, other patient advocacy organizations be successful in helping support these efforts. Um, and FDA, we're always open and willing to discuss any questions because I know that it can be challenging to navigate this as you think about what's the best way to make sure we have uh, drugs available for patients. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we had was, um, what is the FDA doing to promote um, biosimilars or um, other uh, such things? And um, what, it, what is your take on um, helping to reduce the high cost of uh, these type of drugs? Right, so at FDA, we are dedicated to making sure that safe and effective uh, medications are available for patients, and this includes uh, biosimilar products. And FDA has worked with a variety of different stakeholders trying to make sure for the expectations for approval of both biosimilars and products for rare diseases are clear. Um, Could we have found that? When FDA is very clear in the, sort of the expectations, that helps for drug development in different areas. Um, and we work together, meeting frequently with a variety of different 
um, companies and other stakeholders in this area to make sure that we can support product development. Thank you. Um, so the the other question that we received was, um, how does the FDA uh, relate to companies that are working specifically in the development of clinical trials? And uh, what is the relationship with the FDA in making sure to ensure patients' private information is secured uh, in, in, with engagement with those companies? Right, so it sounds like maybe there's two components to that question. So the first part is how FDA works with pharmaceutical companies. And yes. generally we work with, sorry, is that, is that correct? Yes, it's sort of a two, it's a two-fold question. <laughs> yeah, so that's great though, yeah. So the first part is we work extensively uh, with pharmaceutical companies throughout the development process. So generally a pharmaceutical company will meet with FDA actually before they've even um, sort of initiated a clinical study and that they get FDA's recommendations about sort of what dose they should initially use, what sort of safety assessments they should use. And FDA offers support and advice throughout the development process so that there's key time during development from before the product even given to patients to right before the drug will hopefully be approved that FDA works with pharmaceutical companies to answer questions and to make sure that everybody's on the same page and has an understanding of what would be needed to support of approval of that drug. Because our long-term goal is really that uh, we appropriately evaluate medications and hopefully we, um, that that leads to safe and effective drugs being approved. Uh, the second part of the question, it sounded like it was related to confidentiality of information. Um, so when clinical studies are being done, the information is captured by the pharmaceutical company usually, or if it's like an academic investigator by that person, and they would initially be responsible for um, sort of the confidentiality and privacy issues. And clearly we know that that is a significant concern and very important that patient information um, is kept confidential and private. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. And um, the next question is, how do you assess the effectiveness of the orphan of orphan drugs on a patient population? To make sure I'm understanding, like, so how do we assess the effectiveness of all orphan drugs? I think the question was, um, and this was, there's actually a couple people that were asking, but um, with such a small population, what are some of the challenges that you see in, in assessing the effectiveness and how do you take into account that it may be slightly different with, with assessing the effectiveness? Thank form? you, thank you, thank you for clarifying that. Again, though, I think we recognize that the considerations in rare diseases are very different than the consideration in common diseases. So just the amount of clinical data we have might be more limited. And at FDA, we are dedicated to working to support rare disease product development and making sure that we think about rare diseases in terms of the type of information we have may be different, right? If you have a common disease, you may have a trial that's in 5,000 patients, but if you have a rare disease that only affects 10 people, then clearly you would have much more limited information. So we work very closely with pharmaceutical companies to make sure that they are obtaining information that will help support product approval. And we try and think about what is the best way to show that this drug is effective. Um, and something that we found has been helpful in rare diseases is the use of natural history data. So if we have a sense of what the normal course of a specific rare disease is, and then we can give the medication and see if that alters the natural history of the disease, that can be very helpful as we try and understand is this product really effective for this specific rare disease. Great, thank you. And um, Jim, uh, Dr. Maynard, Dr. Maynard, if you don't mind actually referring back um, to um, just further clarify this point about the off-label, because I think that, that that just keeps coming up. I've seen now like three or four comments here um, to get more clarity on off-label. If something is already approved in a similar space or condition to those um, in our own population, so if it's 
for rheumatoid arthritis or another similar condition to those living with myositis, why does it need to go through approval for myositis? Can you sort of explain what 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 that process is and what would why would we be encouraging that as well? What is the off label versus on label use? There's a lot of sure. on that going on in the discussion here. And I think there's sort of two parts of that question. And this is near and dear to my heart as a rheumatologist. So I know that frequently physicians will make decisions about whether or not to use a medication off label, meaning that in post clinic, if there's a drug that's approved for rheumatoid arthritis and then your doctor decides to use it for myositis, that that's a decision that can be made. And then there are no concerns in terms of that. But as many folks on the webinar may be familiar with, we know that sometimes when a product doesn't have sort of the approved indication and it's being used off label, that sometimes there can be issues with insurance coverage. And also sometimes there are limitations in what we know about the product. It hasn't been extensively potentially studied to see the efficacy and safety for a specific disease. So once a product has sort of that approved indication, then additional information would be included in the product labeling. So the information about the product describes the efficacy and safety in that condition. And that's something that sometimes can be beneficial, but that does not restrict a physician from potentially using the drug off label. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and could you say a little bit about what, what would be um, the role of an advocacy organization or our patients in trying to help get um, medications to be you know, either on label or additional, or additional drugs approved? Right, and I think it depends on sort of what the situation is. So sometimes there's already existing clinical trial information. So there's already sort of data available about the safety and efficacy. And then a patient advocacy organization potentially could work with a pharmaceutical company to see if they were interested in working with the FDA to get that information in, like have the product approved for that. If there's not existing sort of safety and efficacy information about the drug, then the first step would be sort of working, probably working with a pharmaceutical company or working with an investigator to get that information. But it's really a collaborative effort because um, usually the patient organizations would need to reach out to whoever is uh, manufacturing or producing the drug to see if they would be interested in expanding the label to have additional information about the rare disease. So there's a variety of different ways to do it, but in general, it's sort of having those conversations both with the person or the company that makes the drug and then working with the FDA to see what kinds of information would be needed to support approval of the product. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, we also um, had a question about how the FDA can help um, stimulate more research and drug development in rare diseases. Yes, and this is very important to us in orphan products. And one way this year that we thought might help stimulate additional um, research and drug development in rare diseases was to get information directly from patients. So we had a public meeting on April 29th where we focused on a variety of different rare diseases and we looked for commonalities across rare diseases, um, looking for sort of commonalities and symptoms. And we thought this could help support drug development by showing that there are similarities across diseases that could help pharmaceutical companies and others important in drug development as they're thinking about endpoints and study design considerations. Um, so we're continuing to do those sorts of efforts where we are working with both um, patients, patient advocacy groups and others um, who are very important in product development to see what we can do to support products for rare diseases. Well, thank you very much, um, and um, this concludes our Q&A portion of the, um, of the webinar, and we appreciate that as well. If you can move to the next slide, LaDonna. Um, these are some websites for following up if you want to follow up, um, and next slide, please. 
And our next webinar will be on reproductive health and myositis um, on August 5th from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock with Dr. Samaritino from the Hospital for Special Surgery. Next slide. And uh, thank you all very much uh, for joining us. And, um, and thank you again uh, to Dr. Maynard and Ms. Bateman for this wonderful and very, very informative uh, webinar. Thank you all. Have a great day.